Hello and welcome to Occupied Thoughts, a podcast brought to you by the Foundation for Middle East Peace. I'm Laura Friedman. I'm the president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. And today is October 26th. And I'm very happy to have with me today my friend and colleague from Human Rights Watch, Omar Shakir. Omar is the Israel-Palestine director at Human Rights Watch. Um, I'm not going to go through his entire bio here, but you can find it linked uh, where this podcast is posted. Um, I've asked Omar to join me today to share his expertise, his insights, his perspectives with respect to the latest attack on Palestinian human rights defenders, uh, this being last Friday's announcement by the government of Israel that it has designated six prominent Palestinian human rights organizations as terrorist groups. Um, and for folks looking for more background on this, I did a podcast last Friday with Inez Adarazic and Sarit Mikhaili from, from um, PIPD and uh, B'Tselem respectively, which is highly recommended listening or watching. Um, and now we have Omar today. So I'm so grateful. Thank you, Omar, for joining me. Thank you for having me. Always a pleasure. So I, I was thinking about what I would ask you, and I was looking at the Human Rights Watch statement, and I thought, wow, this statement is a great script for a podcast. So I am basically going to ask you pieces of the, I'm going to reference the Human Rights Watch <clears throat> statement, which will also have linked to the podcast. And I want you to expand upon these, these, these ideas here because it's a very concise statement. So in its statement, Human Rights Watch, amongst other things, notes that for decades, quote, Israeli authorities have systematically sought to muzzle human rights groups monitoring, sorry, and muzzles human rights monitoring and punish those who criticize its, its repressive rule over Palestinians. I apologize, it's been a very long day already. So can you talk about this systematic effort over years? What does it look like? What brought us to where we are today? Absolutely. I think when you look at Israeli government policy, you sometimes tend to focus on, you know, the tree and miss the forest. And when it comes to human rights uh, defenders, it's important to understand that this decision is part of a larger context, because when you see it in that vein, um, it's easier to understand what's happening here. So the Israeli government, whether it's Israeli, international or Palestinian human rights groups, has sought through various um, ways to effectively shut down their advocacy and reporting. Let me start with internationals, Israelis, and go to Palestinians. You know, on the international front, uh, the primary mechanism that's been used, of course, is to deny entry to those seeking to enter uh, Israel, uh, Israel, Palestine. The Israeli government in 2011 passed effectively um, allows folks to file civil lawsuits against those that alleges support uh, boycotts of Israel. Uh, that law has rarely been actually litigated in courts, but it later translated into a 2017 law that instructs the Interior Ministry to deny entry to those who call for boycotts. Uh, in 2019, of course, the Israeli <laughs> government Sorry. deport If I could, just to clarify for anybody listening, so those laws apply not just to entering Israel, the state of Israel and its sovereign borders, but also entry into the occupied territory. So even someone coming across the Jordan River into the West Bank or from Egypt into Gaza can be blocked based on these laws, correct? That's correct. Technically, you can request a permit only to enter the West Bank. It's a rarely used thing. But yes, generally, um, you know, the vast majority of people seeking to enter the occupied territory do so, um, you know, in this manner. And the Israeli government controls all points of entry effectively to to this territory. So you have this evolution of laws, which began as authorizing civil suits, then denial of entry to, to supporters of boycotts. Then in 2019, the Israeli government deported me, a representative of Human Rights Watch, an organization that actually takes no positions on boycotts based on our work um, advocating for businesses to respect human rights and to refrain from activities that violate them, which we concluded includes operating in settlements. So that's on the front of international human rights defenders. There are many more actions, but that gives you a sense. With Israeli groups, you have legislation passed in 2016 that restricts uh, and, and imposes certain conditions on foreign funding. You have, you know, years of maligning groups um, as traitors, as uh, you know, those that are slandering the state or the army, applied to advocacy groups like Breaking the Silence and B'Tselem. And of course, Palestinians have always borne the brunt of this repression. And when you look at even the groups that are mentioned in this declaration, you can look back at Sha'wan Jabarin. 
uh, the head of Al Haq, who spent years facing a travel ban. Uh, you can look and see Human Rights Watch's reporting on this from a decade ago. You have many of the leaders of Palestinian civil society that were once imprisoned in Israeli jails. But beyond that, you have uh, criminal charges, you have travel bans, a, a Palestinian staff person at Amnesty International, Leith Abu Ziyad faced a punitive travel ban uh, for unspecified security reasons that actually prevented him from obtaining a permit to visit his mother, who was at a hospital in occupied East Jerusalem, three kilometers from his home, and actually died uh, and without Leith being able to say goodbye because the Israeli army denied him a permit. Similarly, you have uh, a situation where Saleh Hamouri, a Palestinian Jerusalemite, a lawyer for Adlamir, who just in the last uh, 10 days uh, had his residency status as a Jerusalemite, his legal status to live in his city of Jerusalem revoked on the basis of a, quote, breach of allegiance, a law that the Israeli government passed that allows it to revoke the legal status of a Palestinian from this area uh, based on a, a breach of allegiance, which is a violation of international humanitarian law. So when you understand this decision against that backdrop of measures against internationals, Israelis and Palestinians, it's easy to see this for what it is. Could you just also talk about the use of anti-terror laws? And I think specifically here, the case that's come up a lot that I think a lot of people have forgotten about entirely is the World Vision case, um, Mohammed Halabi where uh, you have similar terrorism charges lodged against here. It's an international NGO, but it's a Palestinian staffer. Um, can you talk about that at all? Absolutely. I mean, you have a situation here where World Vision, a prominent international organization, had a Palestinian staff person who is based in Gaza, who is doing his job, who uh, has been detained in detention now for over five years, um, you know, being prosecuted on the basis of allegations that he, that he was uh, sort of funneling money that went towards Hamas, allegations that despite more than four years of hearings, the Israeli government has failed to publicly produce evidence showing any connection. These allegations have been investigated carefully by governments, by international institutions to have found, have found to be utterly baseless. But because Mohammed al Halabi refused to accept a plea deal, wanted to actually fight in court for his innocence, continues to be prosecuted. I mean, and with severe due process violations, uh, you know, it's been reported on by a range of, of, of sources, but they include restrictions on what his attorney uh, can say publicly around, um, you know, the, the secrecy of the evidence and their ability to challenge it. So it's important to understand that this was a Palestinian member of an international organization, charges that have not been substantiated, but he served now more than five years in detention. We still don't have a verdict. Right. I, I was actually looking back at this and there was at the time that he was arrested, the public sort of narrative coming out of Israel sounds a lot, sounded a lot like what we've got now. We have absolute evidence, smoking gun evidence, you know, and really just absolutely definitive. And five years later, you've got the Jerusalem Post with an editorial in the past few days suggesting that the fact that they've kept him for five years without producing evidence or charges suggests that this is actually an innocent man and they don't want to admit that he's innocent, so they're keeping him in this purgatory. Um, and I believe there was also another person arrested at the same time from another NGO, maybe I think a UN NGO, who ended up, who again, it was that same huge loud narrative of we've caught this terrorist actor and it ended up he was sentenced to time served and sentenced for unwittingly or inadvertently helping Hamas. They took away any pretense that he was actually a Hamas agent or deliberately helping Hamas. It was like a, a CYA kind of charge. Absolutely. And Laura, I mean, the secret evidence issue is a major one. Of course, Israel holds hundreds of Palestinians in administrative detention without trial and charge based on secret evidence. But let's, let's, let's even say that the Israeli government has reasons for keeping this information secret. Let's even give them the benefit of the doubt. Human Rights Watch in December 2019 published a report where we actually looked at the indictments of Palestinians that had been charged and where the evidence was made public. And the, the report documents the ways in which these charges on their face and the evidence used do not 
hold any level of scrutiny, right? And what Israel does, let's take the charge that's being used here, the uh, support for the popular front for the liberation of Palestine. You have the Israeli government, in essence, uh, saying that a, Pal you know, a Palestinian, even if they're not have any direct connection to armed activities, have no direct involvement in any sort of violence, simply by your association to a, to a political movement, one of the political forces that operates there, even if you're a parliamentarian, even if you're engaged in pure free association stuff, just any sort of affiliation to a group like that is enough on its face under, under military laws that have been in place for decades on end that effectively restrict the basic civil rights of people. So when you understand that the Israeli government's evidence, even if they want to keep it secret, amounts to nothing more in, in most cases than expression of basic rights, you understand this for what it is. It is a, you know, an assault uh, you know, on the basic means of human rights monitoring and advocacy. Yeah, I mean, one thing that's been been interesting for me watching this unroll over the, over the years, and I want to go more into that, is the the you know it, with Israeli society there is a an almost um, it, taken for granted um, whitewashing of Israeli Jews who have been convicted of terrorism. Here I'm thinking of you know there's a prominent Israeli journalist who is all over the media, the Israeli media, who is a member of the Jewish underground. He's a convicted member of the Jewish underground. And that's just forgotten, right? Because he's not engaged in terrorism now, which is correct. But it's like, it doesn't even matter to mention. Um, you have a one of the lawfare organizations, a senior staffer in one of the Israeli lawfare organizations targeting Palestinians who's a convicted terrorist. And it just doesn't bear mentioning. You have people in the Knesset who are affiliated with Kaf and Khan Echai, which are US designated foreign terrorist organizations, not even worth mentioning. But there with Palestinians, you have this six degrees of terrorist association thing and that's seen as, you know, that smoking gun it and we're done. Um, it's, it's, it's quite an extraordinary contrast. <laughs> no, I think, I mean, the reality here is, and this is, you know, something Human Rights Watch documented in our April 2021 20, uh, report, a threshold cross, is that when you have a policy, a system that undergirds a government policy, which is made to privilege one people at the expense of others, you will come up with legal tools and mechanisms to justify ensuring the domination of one people over the other. That's uh, a huge part of Human Rights Watch is finding that Israeli authorities are committing the crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution. And, and that report obviously looked at case studies of different areas uh, where you look at similar areas. And one area that you're pointing to is law enforcement. And you look at the ways in which you know two communities, uh, when they commit the exact same you know sort of uh, crime on your book, right? Let's even even setting aside how you reach that determination, but you look at the ways in which they are treated, you see vastly different results, right? Right now, there are you know more than four hundred Palestinians in administrative detention without trial or charge. There are zero Jewish Israelis, right? You could go down the various you know, ways of slicing the apple, and you're going to find a similar result that when it comes to these sorts of uh, draconian, uh, you know, designations, or these kinds of punitive measures, even if they the laws are facially neutral, even if they're on their face could be applied, uh, they're in practice weaponized a policy to dominate uh, to ensure the domination by Jewish Israelis over Palestinians. Yeah, so I want to so, so I want to go back to the Human Rights Watch statement that was that was very well said. The so you so Human Rights Watch said and about the the latest designation. This decision is an alarming escalation that threatens to shut down the work of Palestine's most prominent civil society organizations. Talk about the escalation. What that means, going from what you've just described to what this means today. So we've had, of course, the Israeli government go after Palestinians, you know, based on their human rights work, right? But typically, they did so by making uh, allegations regarding, you know, a particular person, a particular set, uh, set of activities. Um, but it's an escalation in the sense that you now have, first of all, they're using a, a new law, right, a 2016 Israeli law uh, that, that uh, you know, that, by the way, you know, passed you know, in the Knesset by the Israeli elected government applied to Palestinians who have no say, no voice over that government enforcing those laws. But even putting that caveat aside, now you have, instead of a situation where you have maybe individuals that are being, um, you know, charged based on specific such allegations, you now have a designation that applies to an entire organization that can be the basis to shut them down, 
to seize their assets, to uh, arrest their members and supporters, and even you know to detain those who fund or express support for these for these organizations, right? So in essence, you have the Israeli government who's moved from a situation where Palestinian rights defenders were at risk because they could be individually linked uh, based on tenuous associational arguments to a facial sort of designation that gives the Israeli government at whim the ability to detain uh, representatives of six prominent civil society organizations. You know, these are among the most prominent groups. I mean, Al Haq has been around for more than four decades. I mean, it is in, in the global south, it is actually a shining example of, uh, you know, the, the development of a local human rights group that is grounded in respect for international law that uses the, uh, you know, uh, that bases arguments on fact, on documentation, on law. This sort of model organization is not just them. Abdamir, the work they do with prisoners, you have the, you know, the agricultural work committees, you have these different organizations that are uh, sort of using these international tools and laws and mechanisms that just on that basis of that alone, the Israeli government at whim could, could take these sorts of punitive measures. So it escalates things by taking that step. So instead of the indirect connection, you, you sort of directly allow them to go after people just based on their association to the organizations. And absolutely, they have the full legal ability to shut down these organizations. Yeah, uh, I'm interested. I don't know if you, if you can talk about this at all. You know, the selection of these organizations, obviously there's a history here. NGO Monitor, Ministry of Strategic Affairs, that's an Israeli ministry that has spent years sort of building this guilt by association case. Um, but they've done it around basically the entire Palestinian NGO sector. Um, when I looked at the list of, of the targeted NGOs last Friday, I thought, it seems like they've actually picked the ones that they feel do the most damage. <laughs> like, is the, it, can, can you talk about the kind of work these groups do and why? You know, may, you know, we've joked about Israel changing the, for you to be joked about, you know, there's, there's terrorism, terrorism, there's economic terrorism, that's boycotts, there's diplomatic terrorism, that's going to the UN, there's legal terrorism, that's trying to use courts, there's journalistic terrorism, that's reporting. Maybe we're now talking about human rights terrorism, which is doing human rights work that's effective and causes people to question Israeli policy, that now becomes now a kind of terrorism. Um, can, you, can you just talk about the kind of work we're talking about? I think that's really well put, Laura, because I mean, one of the arguments we made about in you know, opposing measures to punish uh, boycotts, which is a form of recognized peaceful expression used by advocates around the world to fight unjust systems and laws. And now you have not even that you have conventional run of the mill human rights watch documentation and reporting. So, I mean, look, these groups span the gamut. You know, they do work that ranges from, you know, reports documenting human rights abuses, by the way, not only at the Israeli government, but at the Palestinian Authority. If you've been following the news, uh, you know that this summer Al-Haq was one of the most vocal organizations, for example, speaking out against the roundup and beatings of, of, of those protesting the uh, arbitrary arrests and other abuses by the Palestinian Authority. You have a group like Aldamir. Aldamir is involved, and in, in, by the way, in Israeli courts every day, defending uh, the rights of those who are detained uh, around the abuses, you know, they face. You have Defense for Children International in Palestine, you know, a group that every time a Palestinian uh, child is killed, for example, they are investigating the circumstances, they're writing reports, they're engaged in advocacy at the UN and other levels. Uh, you have organizations like BSAN that do, you know, research, uh, you know, publications. And uh, committees and, and, the, and the women's committees that, again, doing the kind of union sort of based organizing and work that's pretty common to uh, civil society groups the world across. So, I mean, yeah, in a sense, the way you put it, Laura, is very astute because, you know, not only are they saying that you can't, you know, obviously violence is, is violence, you know, but then BDS is a threat to the state and, you know, in the same category now, human rights reporting, you know, publishing research, legal representation, uh, you know, they're effectively telling a Palestinian anything but submission is outlawed. Uh, and I think that's, that's, that's the way to understand this decision. I don't see what other way the Israeli government allows you. And again, we're not even talking about the millions of military laws in place in the West Bank that says you could face 10 years in prison by organizing a demonstration of that a permit or hosting a Palestinian flag, the Israeli government has the legal infrastructure to turn any act of defiance by a Palestinian 
into a criminal offense and grounds for detention. Yeah, I mean, I, I was thinking about the, the whole framing here that we've seen where um, the escalation, whether it's using BDS and saying BDS is equivalent to anti-Semitism, which equals terrorism, that's all the same, or even what we saw, I think it was last year, the year before with the US, a right-wing pro-Israel US NGO, um, asking the Justice Department to uh, investigate Black Lives Matter, claiming that it was tied to terror because of its links to the BDS movement. Um, you see that, that, that misuse or hijacking of the whole fighting terror thing. Um, the, where does this, I guess this is a big question, but like, you know, where do you see this going next in terms of the escalation? Um, setting aside the fighting and what the, what the world should be doing, and I want to ask you about that, but on the Israeli sort of menu of activities, if they are not checked in some way by the international community, what happens next? Because this is just six out of a long list of targeted NGOs. Absolutely. I mean, I think the Israeli government is, and again, we'll, I know we'll get later to why this, why the international community's response is vital, because I think, it, you know, in, in many cases, what the Israeli government does will hinge on how the international community responds. But it, this is sort of the typical way the Israeli government escalates, right? That it it gives itself the authority to act in a particular way, um, you know, and then it maybe doesn't act right away. Take annexation, take so many other examples, you know, not building in certain areas. You know, it's the long game. It's getting the authority to do so. Probably now, um, you know, I, you could see a scenario where, you know, the international community settles for a solution in which this decision is not rescinded, but rather uh, it's on the books, but Gantz and, and the Israeli government promises, vows, not to act pursuant to this declaration. And maybe it sits that way for some time until the Israeli government sees fit um, to then you know, detain a, a certain yeah, but representative. If, but if they do that, I mean, the, for instance, the funding will probably dry up for these organizations, even if they don't actively, I mean, the, the, something that you, re, you referenced these efforts along in the past, but the efforts that we've seen mainly have been targeting Europe using these allegations of terrorism for years to try to commit, convince European governments not to fund them. Um, so that's, that's another point altogether, right? Which we're not even getting to the second order effects. I mean, even if the, the letters of the letter of the, the law is not enforced, even if they're not shutting down, freezing access, closing people, and that absolutely is a huge part of it. I mean, there's a very organized effort by the Israeli government that's been ongoing for years to link the work of Palestinian civil society groups to terrorism as a way to dry up their funding. And it's already led in a number of cases with European governments, with other, with other governments to investigations, you know, being opened. And even when those investigations have been shut for a lack of evidence, you have a, you have a situation in which groups have spent months, years in some cases, without funding, having to lay off staff, having to sort of spend their resources defending uh, you know, their work against baseless allegations. So the funding is clearly the target here. And the Israeli government figures that just putting this designation uh, there, uh, you know, will itself scare off donors, will make this sort of, uh, you know, the, the routine task of, you know, providing funding to a civil society group, which is even where governments are uh, impotent in stopping human rights abuse, usually, you know, the funding and support for civil society is the one thing there. And this, this measure absolutely um, threatens to, to dry up the funding for Palestinian civil society group, tie them up in uh, efforts, even litigation to undo this. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, you know, it has the desired effect of scaring people off. So I think even if the Israeli government does not shut them down, arrest members, the effects on funding and the ability of these groups to operate is seriously thrown into question by this decision. And, and you're talking about second order effects. I'm thinking second and third order. I was looking at the uh, headline today that M. Tirtsu, which is a very far right wing Israeli um, organization, is already basically looking to find ways to, I think it's in Jirtsu, I saw as a headline trying to weaponize the, the work of, of Israeli NGOs with Palestinian NGOs against them. It may not be in Jirtsu, I should double check that before anyone can give me a, I, I don't wanna say it, I, I don't wanna even think I'm, I'm, I'm saying this without being sure. So um, yeah, I'll double check that while you're giving your next answer. So the next question is talking about the international community. I'm going to quote again, the decades, this is HRW, the decades long failure of the international community to challenge grave Israeli human rights abuses and impose meaningful consequences for them has emboldened Israeli authorities to act in this brazen manner. 
So, Manner, I want you to talk to me about impunity. I want you to talk to me about what, how international, what it means would to say the international community has been impotent so far, either unwilling or unable to engage, and what effect that impotence has had on the, the status and the safety of the human rights defender sector. Absolutely. I mean, you know, in, in any situation, Laura, I mean, I used to cover Egypt for Human Rights Watch. It's, it's governments will take sort of steps to sort of gauge what reaction they get. They'll assess that, you know, uh, the effect of that action and they'll decide what to do next. In the case of the Israeli government, you have years long of international community warning about sanctions if they build this settlement or if they continue with demolitions or if they take further steps to uh, you know, uh, use unlawful force or, you know, continue with a particular law or policy. And ultimately that happens. Uh, they take the step, no consequences imposed, and that gives them the uh, sort of uh, the, the green light to take the next step, right? And it, and it happens with human rights defenders, right? I mean, again, uh, we started talking about the evolution of the anti-boycott from a civil suit to denying entry to BDS supporters to deporting uh, a human rights uh, watch official in, in the span of, in, in the span of the time. Each step of the way, we warned that if you let that happen without consequence, you're then opening the door. And one of the scenarios that when I was doing interviews and events around my, I warned if you allow a representative of human rights watch to be deported based on their work, you are then giving the green light to the Israeli government to then go. And I, we even warned about outlawing or criminalizing the work of local civil society groups. And I remember people looking at me being like, that's not going to happen. They've been around for four decades. But lo and behold, I was deported. The Israeli government did not face any sort of countermeasure or reaction from the international community. Uh, and, and here we are. Right. And so when you mentioned this lawsuit, uh, now that's going to go after Israeli civil society groups. Yeah, if you let this decision stand against these Palestinian human rights groups, the Israeli groups do the same thing. They use the same language. They use the same kinds of methodologies, right? And eventually, if the Israeli government makes the same determination that they want to shut down that work and they got away with it, with the, the, the Palestinian counterparts, what's to stop them from going after the Israeli ones? Especially when you take into account what you and I have been discussing of this sort of long-term trend. So I think, Laura, when it comes to Israel-Palestine, it can be a broken record for us that work in human rights. We always say impunity fuels further abuse, whether it be you know unlawful force, settlement construction, or attacks on human rights defenders. And this, I mean, there's not even a pretense here, right? The Israeli government has said we're sending representatives to the U.S. to explain this decision, right? In essence, they're saying we're going to kind of feel out what response we get. And that'll determine what step we take next. They're telegraphing that, right? They've called the bluff of the international community a thousand times. And frankly, each time they've won. Well, and, and to some extent, the, the World Vision case is a template for how to do this. You come up, you know, just all guns blazing with, you know, smoking gun, smoking gun. And then by the time it's clear you don't have real evidence, everyone's lost interest and the people are still in jail. I want to clarify for anyone listening, I actually can't find the headline that I referenced. I don't know where I found it, so I'm not going to actually, I, I'm not positive that it's correct, so please do not take it on my authority that this ha what's happening inside Israel targeting Israeli organizations. I don't know if that's happening yet, um, and I certainly don't want to accuse any specific NGO of doing that without any evidence, and I cannot find the headline. So we're going to say that that isn't happening for now, and you know we'll look for it ourselves. But certainly the expectation that it could happen is there. Um, so I want to close with a- And Laura, let, let me add before, before you move on, let me just add the law allows them to do that, right? So if you express support for these Right. And you have many brave Israeli human rights defenders that are coming out and saying, you know, OK, you know, apply the law to me. I support this organization. So even if it hasn't happened yet, and I hope we haven't planted the idea in anybody's head now, you know, it's the legal basis is there to do it. Yeah, I mean, and, and for folks who, who aren't on Twitter or other social media, there has been since Friday an outpouring of statements of solidarity from the Israeli human rights sector. Um, you know, to the extent that, that this is a measure of how mainstream um, some or all of these Palestinian NGOs um, are, is, it, it, is really, um, it is really striking. Um, I want to ask you as a final question. I'm going to read the, this is, towards the end of the Human Rights Watch statement. Um, 
quote, how the international community responds will be a true test of its resolve to protect human rights defenders. And I'm assuming you mean not just in the Palestine context, but more broadly, because, you know, for folks who always say, who, who always defend Israel by saying, oh, you're just focusing on Israel, you're holding Israel to a different standard. I think it's worth noting that human rights defenders have been concerned about this specific trend in illiberal countries across the world, and particularly the, the weaponization of the anti-terrorism charges. Um, so Israel is certainly not alone in doing this, but this appears to be an incredibly high profile test of whether countries can get away with it. So can you talk about what that means and how you think the international community should, should be responding, including the United States? Yeah, and I would recommend folks read your, your Twitter thread, Laura, where you cite a number of examples from countries around the world of the use of terrorism charges to go after civil society organizations. It's certainly not unique to Israel. What I mean by that, Laura, is generally you'll find entire governments that will say protection of human rights defenders is a key principle to us. You know, we may not be able to act on concrete human rights abuse, but we believe firmly in protecting human rights defenders. So that's a nice thing to say. And it's easy to have that policy in countries where there's no, you know, maybe a perception there's no the limited political cost, you know, to speaking out about the detention, uh, you know, by a authoritarian regime and, and say sub-Saharan Africa who, who, who detains a dissident. You know, but this is a real test for you because these are organizations that are not fringe organizations. These are organizations with deep ties to civil society uh, across the world. I mean, Sha'wan Jabarin Fal Haq has been on is on the advisory board of Human Rights Watch. You can find numerous other deep connections. Uh, Al Haq has been awarded uh, uh, by the French government. Numerous other, you know, publications. And this is a case where you know recognized, respected human rights groups are under attack. They are being effectively outlawed, right? And um, you know, and these are groups that uh, you know are as you know conventional run-of-the-mill human rights groups as they come. So if the international community really says that protection of human rights defenders is our creed, show us that you're willing to apply the same standards you apply everywhere else to Israel when it comes to speaking out and imposing consequences where human rights defenders are at risk. If you don't, then your principles are not principles, but they're in fact politically expedient, uh, you know, sort of slogans that you'll use when convenient. And that's not a principle. So when we say uh, in our statement, which we issued with amnesty, that, you know, this is a test, we really mean that, you know, in many ways, and this is true of so many things about Israel-Palestine, where we often say the international system, right? If the International Criminal Court, uh, you know, isn't able to, in a case where it has jurisdiction, uh, you know, exercise a jurisdiction, investigate crimes. If you have a situation where countries have policies around arms sales and human rights conditionality that you apply, if you don't apply that same standard to the Israeli government that you apply everywhere else in the world, then you're not sincere about that commitment. And so uh, that for us, it is, it is absolutely a test. And we'll, you know, we look to the international community to, um, you know, ensure that they uh, protect these Palestinian civil society groups, and that they don't just stop there, but that they understand the nexus between this sort of designation and the underlying reality where the Israeli government is committing grave abuses, crimes against humanity for apartheid and persecution. Uh, this decision reflects the reality of apartheid and persecution against millions of Palestinians, and you're going to need to ultimately deal with those grave abuses if you're going to actually uh, do everything else. Because once a system like this continues to be allowed to operate, these are the kinds of things it does. Yeah, and, and I'm, you know, listening to you, I'm, I'm thinking back to my call with Inez and Sarit on Friday. And what you see, I mean, even best case scenario, and the international community does push back, what we're seeing now is all of the energy and oxygen being spent on defending the organization's existence and not looking at the actual human rights that they're defending, which continue to be violated on the ground every day, even while this game of misdirection is going on and all we're paying attention to is this part of the news cycle, um, which makes this an incredibly effective tactic. Even, even if Israel gets pushed back, it's still an effective tactic on this, right? Yeah, 
Absolutely. I mean, look, the, you know, we, just a week ago, we were talking about the uptick in settler violence, announcements about new settlements, uh, you know, being built, uh, you know, a range of other measures. And suddenly all of our oxygen, our time, our resources are just trying to revert back to the status quo of last Thursday, right? Uh, you know, without sort of getting, and that's always the case, right? In Gaza, we're trying to, you know, uh, uh, revert back to pre-hostilities, which is trying to get back to pre-closure, which is trying to get back to pre-occupation, which is trying to get back to pre, you know, 1948. I mean, it's this layer and layer where the target keeps moving. And in every case, you can't even get back to the way it was before that step was taken. And the international community has no recognition of the way the scale continues to slide. All right, we're going to end it here. There's many more questions that I, I, I suspect we'll be asking you back for a webinar or podcast soon, Omar. But in the meantime, I'm going to thank you for joining us today and sharing your expertise and your insights. Um, truly uh, fascinating and so important um, for our audience. Thanks, as always, for listening or watching. And finally, as always, oh, by the way, if you want, we mentioned a lot of resources here, the report from HRW, um, a line, what's a, a line frost, a... Um, What's the title? Threshold there? crossed. Threshold crossed. Yes, it makes more sense. Threshold crossed and the statement by HRW and a few other things. You'll find those posted with this podcast on the FMEP website, www.fmep.org. And please go ahead, subscribe to this podcast. And that way you won't miss any of the great content that we are producing every week. Um, iTunes, SoundCloud, or Spotify, you can subscribe on any of those sites. Um, and with that, I'm going to sign off. This is Laura Friedman, president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace, thanking Omar Shakir for joining me today. And we'll see you on the next edition of Occupied Thoughts.